So we have uh, Julie, head of product at Believe, a digital music company. And uh, then we have Omar, SPM as, uh, at Booking, where probably all of you have um, gotten this room is selling out fast. Right? <laughs> and Ivan from IKEA, uh, also living quite close to uh, the venue here, uh, which I found out during the coffee break. Um, Ivan has a background as an engineer and anthropologist, which I think is also super interesting. I will dive into, and, and myself, founder of Product People, probably most of you saw the uh, earlier intro, we do interim product management as a service. Uh, so, the uh, first question we're going for, and I'll address that to Julie, uh, what is the relationship between building a strong product culture and achieving product-led growth? Um, yeah, uh, there's, uh, I, would, I would say that there's a pretty strong relationship between the two because in both product-led growth and having a product culture, you need your product team to, be, to really be leading initiatives and you also need to be very much focusing on data centricity uh, in both cases. You need your product managers to know about your users and your user behavior to really drive strategy. And when you're working on a product that has product-led growth, you're also mostly relying on data and not simply, re uh, not simply relying on your salespeople to give you information about the market. So I think also data centricity is a big thing that they have in common. Yeah, I think, well, one of the things, or just thinking about the name of strategies, I think it's interesting also to analyze the current context and the company you work for or even the department. Uh, of course, we all would like to go into product-led growth, but the reality is that in many places, many companies, many departments, we are not even there. So I think starting to understanding the water in which I'm swimming in and understanding what are the challenges in order to go there. Uh, usually you want to go there, but if you don't know where you're coming from, who do you need to talk to, uh, or actually who are the game changers in your organization in order to go into these uh, product-led growth. Meaning, you know, you might come back with great ideas, but probably your own company culture doesn't allow that. Or it's just, I don't know, sales-led or marketing-led. Uh, but I think for these strategies to work, uh, just start like analyzing where, where we really are. How is my company or my organization really organized in terms of these product culture. Is there a product culture? Is a, it needs to be built or is more like an engineering culture where engineers have more voice? You know? I, I love that. Um, it's this term from military strategy, uh, UDA loop, orient, observe, orient, decide, act. And it's also familiar to what you're saying, right? First understand the, the context where you're at and then decide and act. Oh, what's I, I wasn't thinking in war, but uh, hopefully we don't need to get there at the <laughs> company yeah. and <laughs> fight with people. But yeah, in a way, for me, coming from an uh, anthropology background is about understanding the setting and where you want to go. This is very strategy one-on-one, -on -one, you know? Yeah. But uh, Systemic thinking. Yeah, so, so in a way, we all want, would love to run our products from a product-led perspective or growth perspective, but the reality is many of us are in organizations that don't even allow that or they haven't thought about that before, you know? Yeah, that's kind of like, like testing the waters before you go in and understanding what kind of landscape you're getting involved with. And if, if, if you think about it, actually, like what Anul was saying in the last presentation, Shifting to product-led is like a major horizontal initiative that you have to go through. So basically, the things that he has been saying applies to the same. You have to, you know, identify the, as you said, the stakeholders, different departments. What are they actually hoping to achieve? And try to find this common area of interest or this common goal that everyone is trying to to reach in order to get the buy-in and the trust and so on. So you would get people on board with this initiative and trying to shift for them to understand the impact and the effect of how this might actually be very useful to what they are trying to achieve uh, as, as functional departments and to shift to that mindset. All right, ne next question, I'll also start with Julie. How do you identify that your organization is lacking a product culture? Yeah, um, so I prepped a little bit for this, so bear with me. Um, 
I have worked at uh, sales-oriented tech companies for over 10 years, and I've gotten a pretty strong sense of what a lack of product culture can do to your product, to your teams, and to your overall organization. Um, so if anyone here is wondering if the topic of product culture specifically applies to you, here's how I think that you can spot that you're working in a sales-led organization that is lacking product culture. First, I think that you have multi-channel feature requests. If your organization is lacking product culture, chances are that your product team is getting feature requests from every communication channel. Your PMs may be getting feature requests at the coffee machine, in the elevator, in unrelated meetings, by email, on Slack, or, in t or Teams, etc. Now, I personally remember working as a PM and actively avoiding the coffee machine a few times. You may also be familiar with customer-facing teams asking you to deliver a feature in two weeks. This is usually followed by an explanation of how it's a very simple feature with a very simple button, and it should be very quick and easy for you to build. Obviously, we just love that as product people, but yet this is very common if you're lacking product culture in your organization. I also noticed a consistent pattern where the sales team would uh, give us a lot of detailed information about the exact solution that they wanted us to build, but yet we would get very little insight about the actual pain points that this was addressing, the number of clients that were impacted, uh, their context, etc. Something else, sales pitch homogeneity. When I first joined my last organization, and the company was 100% sales uh, culture at the time, I started my onboarding as a PM by attending product demos and sales meetings with the sales team. What I saw was that there were as many product demos and product pitches as there were salespeople. Every salesperson was pitching a different product positioning, different user value, and different product storytelling. And so what I learned right there and then is that if your product vision hasn't been pinned down, communicated, and evangelized by your product team, then every salesperson will rightfully make their own, creating a gap between each prospect's understanding of your brand and product. I also noticed a consistent pattern of the sales team saying yes to prospects in, in meetings, and then they run to the product team and ask us to develop a feature quickly, since they've just already committed to having it in the product or having it in the roadmap. Um, I actually have a little note for this. <laughs> um, incidentally, um, you may find that your product team starts to get blamed for missed deals by the sales team. You'll hear that the sales team has lost an opportunity to competitor X because they have a feature that you just haven't built yet. And in parallel, in bad times, Product managers will blame the sales team for poor company performance since they've been stripped themselves of accountability and sometimes even of interest over impact and company performance. In the end, your product team starts to feel really demotivated. Product discovery can be limited to just studying how to best deliver a requested feature. And the biggest success factor that UPMs end up feeling accountable for is a simple ability to ship a requested feature in due time. Now, I've seen this happen almost every time that I was part of a product team whose roadmap was dictated by sales, uh, by sales needs. Um, and in the worst of times, I've been part of product teams that felt like they were just running after features and kind of running out of breath. And I think that the worst end of the road risk that you may encounter here is that you may end up building a Frankenstein product that gathers a lot of different uh, features, matching the needs of multiple different prospects and multiple different one-time deals. So basically, your product gets complex, your user journey gets confusing, and your product positioning may start to feel very vague, both within your organization and on the market as well. So if any of this feels depressing or familiar to anyone here, this may, need, uh, this may mean that you have to start working on either strengthening or just building your product culture in your organization. But the good news is this is something that uh, you can really do and that is usually beneficial to the entire organization. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So uh, uh, <coughs> something that I wanted to add to this, and maybe it's, it's the same thing but from another perspective, that uh, mm -hmm. um, for me a big part of um, this is, re is related to how ownership is defined, and I really like to use this ownership word I just I was just telling mm -hmm. you, and I'm having a talk tomorrow with a lot of ownership in it. Um, 
it's, uh, it's about how ownership is perceived and defined by top management and by the product organization, even the functional organizations in, inside the organization, the uh, different business units. Uh, because um, the symptoms that you are saying, uh, one of the causes for those is that these functional business units, they, they still perceive and see and probably empowered by the top management uh, that they have the full ownership over this function, no matter what's going on. And they are, uh, the, the, um, the product teams are defined or perceived as the technical support teams. That's why this, um, you know, uh, implication or uh, b behavior of, okay, this is exactly what I need, you have to do it this way, and just, you know, processing requests and, and, and all of that going on is because the product team is not perceived as a product team, just as a technical support. And also because um, either the product team is not defending their stance of being actually product and doing product work, or they're not being empowered enough and being heard enough uh, where they're trying to defend the, this kind of scope. And the problem with ownership is that it's, it's not a fight on ownership of who should own things and, uh, and, and run things around. And I think that product-led behavior attitude uh, is, is not about fully owning everything, but it's about actually co-owning with the, with the relevant business unit. So there is this product that we co-own. Uh, the business counterpart owns the, the business-related things, and the product owns the, the mindset of how to evolve the product and how to grow it and how to move with it and the customer centricity thinking and everything. And both should work together and should co-own this um, uh, this product and, and the strategy for it and how to develop it from, from two perspectives that are completing and, uh, and supporting each other to, to, to eliminate the symptoms that you uh, are talking about eventually and have an actual impact in, in the growth of, uh, of, of that product. Mm. So, well, for yeah. me, uh, two comments. Uh, at, well, we're still identifying, right? So we're in, in that phase. Uh, so yeah. if we're trying to get into product-led from where we're coming from, I think, uh, or, or I see this as two levels. One is the your product org, your product team, you know, the people who you are daily working with, you know, designers, engineers. But then there is the level of the whole organization. So yeah. in order to identify, at least for me, it's, it's usually, usually the best is to find anti-patterns. Uh, what are, <laughs> how things are not really working uh, on, a, on at this first level of product environment, direct environment. Yeah. Uh, lately, there has been a lot of conversations um, uh, around product operations, and it's directed in this area in which all the operations from a product perspective only can be improved, you know, product metrics and all that. But then comes the complete or whole organization when sometimes, uh, as you mentioned, product is just seen as a producer of something or of a feature yeah. makers, you know? Yeah. So that is anti-pattern. I mean, if all you're doing is features and, and getting requests for features, that's a totally anti-pattern. You're not actually doing product management work where you should be discovering, understanding your users, uh, working on your, you know, HCI, you know, human uh, machine interaction, how, how are you getting in touch, touch points with your users? Um, and I think that is kind of like the how to identify that. And when it comes to ownership that you mentioned, it's <coughs> funny because when, when, well, doing consultancy for uh, different companies, at the end, ownership, when you talk to business people, is who owns the P&L? Yeah. Who owns the budget and who signs it off? So that's the real owner. So then a person, a product person is given ownership just to create or to play with a product area. But most of us, and I, will, I'm, I won't ask, but who actually owns his own or her own P&L in his product department? Are you able to report on profit and losses? Are you able to hire your own people and create? So I think it, at the end, and this is the reality, it comes to the money and also in many in big companies, the power. You know, yeah. like how are these power, you know, uh, plays? 100% pl on, on this. And to be honest, in all our work so far with different clients, we haven't seen much of it. I'm familiar that at Stripe, a uh, product has P&L, including marketing budget, because they can understand, okay, how much uh, advertising are we investing on this and on, on that. Uh, 
There was a bit of it at director level at OMIO, in, in a sense, um, let's say the director of expansion was looking, okay, these are routes or areas that are growing, let's uh, talk with the marketing team to invest a bit more paper, uh, paper ads there, then uh, rather in, in this part. Um, but honestly, maybe in Europe, this is not developed um, as much, uh, also from a compensation of the PM's perspective, right? Because what, what if PMs had bonuses, like salespeople, right? If, if you want to do a thought experiment. So it, it's, it's indeed, um, I, I like how you're approaching it as a systemic issue or a systemic incentive. And, and even that example you just said, you know, uh, with um, these business people think marketing is the first person I pull off and, and start working on this. So if we really want to go into a product-led growth approach or organization, organizational culture, uh, the company, the, the organization should be thinking, let's bring the PM first because this is the small CEO who's gonna help me drive marketing, sales, product, engineering, design, uh, it, user interaction, all these metrics. So hopefully that's how we work and how we would like to work where we actually run, actually facilitate all these conversations in order to come up with the best or best approach or solution. But that's, that's well, this is what I've found. I'm not saying this is not, yeah. what, what I'm trying to paint here is like a journey. I mean analyzing, identifying where we are and how we get there. And I think those questions are in that line, how we actually come with a strategies or take home like a practical, pragmatic ways approaches here and come back and, and say, okay, let's go, if we really want to go into product-led growth. Yeah, um, um, that's actually why I think that ownership is one of the keys to that because, mm. so, <clears throat> it's it's one of the steps, uh, discussing ownership is one of the steps into reaching that eventually. And I think it's one of the most empowering steps because if, if, if it worked, you know, it would establish some sort of uh, collaboration that would lead into that at some point because I don't know for anyone else, but for me as a PM, I don't want to eventually be managing PNL, right? That That's for the business side of things. Uh, and as you said, it's it's not managing the whole thing, it's fa facilitating the collaboration between all the moving parts within some sort of a mindset or a framework that has a lot of things that we believe in in, in place, like experimentation, like uh, like customer centricity, mm -hmm. like uh, basing everything on data and, and so on. It's about you know putting this system or putting this framework into place and collaborating with everyone just to make sure that you know we're increasing our efficiency and, and impact and everything. And that doesn't mean like, you know, sole ownership of, of things, but co-ownership mm. and, you know, leaving some things that we don't also want to like overload ourselves with to the business counterpart uh, as, as they're doing. So mm. it's complementing the same thing that you were saying. Mm. So. And, and about product managers in PNL, I, I agree. And I think it also joins the previous talk that we had uh, about horizontal um, initiatives where as a PM, you don't necessarily have to own the PNL, and that's okay, but as long as you're not siloed, as long as you're able to talk uh, with the people that are more responsible for it, and try and sort of understand your, I don't think you're ever gonna be the owner, but really try and understand uh, what, what are our biggest costs, how are we most making revenue, and let yeah. me speak with you, and let me show you that I'm interested in these things, and let me show you that my product strategy is also going to depend on the outcome of my conversation with you. Uh, that's also how you don't have to be owner of everything, but as long as you include every um, sort of department, major department of the company in your conversations and strategy, you can be product led. Mm -hmm. One more follow up question on the di diagnosis part and then we can move also with the solution. Um, what if this is also a symptom of the PM or sometimes they're called product owner just being weak within that organization? So sometimes we've noticed that companies are not uh, that sophisticated of hiring for these roles and they end up with people who get overwhelmed very fast and, and don't understand the part about them creating scope and driving this. They're more on the accepting receiving part, right? And then the rest of the organization just takes that prompt and pushes things onto them. And we, we did notice in, in a few of our parental covers and so on that uh, so sometimes the other PMs we were working with uh, weren't up to speed with, let's say, what 
we would call product people materials. So we were saying, okay, yeah, we need kind of spoon feed to these people and handhold them. Um, they would have been more like associate level, you know, and I would see then why others, especially if you're dealing with sales or marketing, which tend to be strong personalities, very driven, then they shove things on you because they see that you're not capable necessarily of um, taking something, shaping it up and driving it with others. Uh, so how would you see, let's say, if you're going to an organization, is it the PMs that are here or is it the, the, is it the system man that, that's um, not working? Yeah, so I, I would say here that that's why I say that, uh, said that PMs should be uh, like um, self, uh, have self-initiative into defending this, uh, this territory. If the um, management is not empowering product enough, then product should demand empowerment somehow. And again, it's not a fight, but if, if, if there is this situation, for example, as, as a PM, I would like try to track some use cases that I saw that should have gone another way and with data provide evidence that, okay, if something else had happened, maybe it would have had a better outcome and that's why I'm saying that we should do this and that and maybe let's, next time let's try to be more driven into that area and that's how you would demand empowerment at some point by providing evidence that there is a better way in doing things with mm -hmm. existing use, uh, use cases. And it has to be demanded. If you're not empowered enough, you have to demand empowerment. Of course. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree, and also um, I, I think that obviously if you feel like your PMs are a bit uh, too junior to really take on that role and, and talk to different teams, I think it's absolutely the, the role of their managers and of their leaders to sort of show them the way. It's, a, it's one example among, among many others, but you were mentioning how salespeople have end-of-the-year bonuses. Um, I've worked at companies where the product managers had bonuses, and I think it's important to make sure the bonus has nothing to do with the number of features that you've shipped. It's yeah. not your roadmap. Um, you can give a bonus based on uh, a data impact, for example. And we know the whole thing about creating impact teams. So instead mm -hmm. of asking a product manager to deliver three features, you can ask them to, uh, I don't know, have uh, five or 10 percent more monthly active users uh, or adoption on a feature. And that way, they sort of have to upscale with your help and with the help of the organizational structure that's been uh, put on them. This is really cool. So thank you for the input. <laughs> Do you mean the room, right? Cool or? Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I was told by Ruth that the temperature has um, no, it's getting increased. Warm, yeah. But I don't know. If, does anyone still feel cold? Hands up. Well, after coffee, I think it's... No, no one is feeling uh, <laughs> that it's chilly? Okay, that, that, that's good. We made you look up from your phone. Um, so from, from your experience, what would be effective strategies? We already started touching upon that in the answers. Is there something else you could think of, something you've seen work in your experience? Also happy to take a prompt from the room, or it's like raise hand um, if, if you have a personal experience to, to, to mention in 90 seconds. Um, otherwise, <laughs> over to the speakers. No, just to make sure like, someone doesn't start uh, relieving their college days and what they ate for breakfast. It, it's funny <laughs> that here we're trying to come up with a strategy to become product-led, uh, but next door they're talking about sales-led. So yeah. Yeah. it's like, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> but uh, but uh, probably the first strategy is to get rid of that uh, event. No, just kidding. <laughs> and let everyone in here. Um, no, go ahead. You were going to... Uh, Sorry, I yeah, no, sidetracked. Right. <coughs> Sorry, have a, We should have a product sales led alliance uh, <laughs> next, <laughs> next year. That's, Always, that's you know, there. like. Um, Good right. mediator. Uh, no, oh, wow. Yeah. Two mediators, yeah. yeah. Um, right, so uh, obviously, I think that there's a lot of things that you can put in place to change your company culture from sales to product led, or at least to building a stronger product culture. But I'm happy to talk about here some of the few main things that we did at my previous organization and that had a strong impact on creating a product culture. So I think that the first thing may sound pretty counterintuitive, but what I want to stress on most is that as product people, and especially as product leaders, we need to clarify, evangelize, and show as much pride in what our product is and does than in what it isn't and doesn't do. I think we need to be clear and unapologetic about the types of users that uh, our product addresses, 
the issues it chooses to solve, the ones it chooses not to, and how we've distinctly chosen to fix these issues for our users. For example, I always start every internal product presentation by explaining what we're doing and why, and what we're not doing and why. What I started to notice when doing this is that this visibly empowered our sales team to stand in front of prospects and actually say with confidence, no, we don't actually have that feature, but that's because we believe that this is the way that you're gonna solve your issue, not that. Now you know you have uh, a strong and impactful product culture when your sales team is actually able to explain your product vision to prospects, especially when that means saying no with a clear and confident um, explanation. Uh, I also noticed when I started to do this that this also allowed our sales team to give us feedback that was a lot more aligned with our positioning and therefore a lot more valuable to the product team. Now, of course, for this to work, you need your business and your product strategies to be very well aligned so that your sales team isn't torn between incompatible visions. When it comes to managing internal product <coughs> feedback, something that we did is that we created an internal mandatory product feedback template. You don't need any specific tool for this. Uh, you can use uh, free spreadsheets, forms, et cetera, or a paid for solution. But we actually made sure that the template was precisely asking the customer's uh, functional and business pain points, their context, the number of clients that were impacted by this, the associated deal size, et cetera. You can always have an optional question at the end asking them uh, what their preferred solution is. But what this is going to do is that it's actually going to train your sales teams um, on product culture, and they're gonna start to grasp what type of information is actually valuable to product teams. Of course, this is also going to make it easier for your product teams to qualify and centralize internal feedback. Something else that I think can be really positive is that I would strongly encourage uh, launching uh, company-wide uh, product rituals within your organization. For example, at one organization, we launched a uh, one-hour product talk every last Friday of the month. Every single team was meant to join, and they all did. So this included all salespeople, all customer success, marketing, tech teams, top management, etc. For these talks, I would strongly suggest that you let your PMs present topics as well. This really helped us with team uh, empowerment, motivation, and visibility. When it comes to topics to present, I would say keep in mind that the objective of these talks isn't to, uh, to deep dive into your latest product update or your product features, but to really instill a product culture. So of course you can use this talk occasionally to talk about your product roadmap, but you can best use it to evangelize key product concepts. So you can use an hour and actually deep dive into your product vision or your product strategy. You can share a uh, product success story you can explain uh, what product development is, um, or you can use this time to, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll wrap it up, I think. <laughs> or you can use this time uh, to explain how your team uh, prioritizes input and feedback. I think it's really important in these talks to repeat, repeat, and repeat the key concepts. I would say don't think that because you've explained once what a sprint or agile development means, then all your teams got it for good. Know the key things that you want your teams to know about your product and keep repeating these each time. And the last thing I'll say is that I think it's really important to acknowledge that a customer success or sales team's uh, lack of trust in products comes from the idea that they know the market and the customers and you don't. And this is actually a very valuable and valid concern. So I think it's very important to have every PM attend at least one sales meeting per month to stay in touch with the market and gain this credibility and this also tends to create informal bonds between your product and your sales teams. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Uh, yes, so yeah. I, I guess that's a subtle message to move on to the uh, questions we received from everyone. So it seems Victoria with a C um, asks, as we have it, Victoria with a K is here with me today. Um, what's the biggest difference between horizontal initiatives and regular project initiatives within the company? Who wants to take this? Previous. Okay, which uh, were the... Uh, wait, I think the building on Mirella's comment was from now, and someone just dismissed it. Um, maybe we could bring this back. Okay. 
about being a strong PM? How do you earn respect, trust to confidently lead and, and make your yeah, organization product-led, especially when others want to lead? That was from the last year? The last yeah. one also as well. So for uh, so, so it's it's yeah, a part of it's stakeholder just, management, yeah. right? And and building this uh, reputation within your organization. Um, Victoria has a good talk on our product people channel about stakeholder management coming from mapping them and then what are the tactics to apply depending on their importance and strength within the things that that you work on. Mm -hmm. um, I will let also others take it. Um, I would start first. I think even Marty Kagan has this in his book, Empowered, where he describes its function, like sales, marketing, design, engineering, because those are also very strong stakeholders that sometimes want to step a bit on you, and seeing what are their incentives, uh, what's driving them, what language they like to be talked on, and then start building that report. Once you have that report, um, doing a few small favors and then starting to guide them within the direction that you want to take. Uh, but of course, that, that won't happen immediately. So you first still need to be liked, build a report, gain a bit of trust, and then start nudging people within the direction that you want them to take, unless you have this super strong mandate from leadership, you know, like pulling an Elon, where it's just, no, okay, from yeah. today we do this, or you're not, not here. But in Europe, it doesn't really work like I that. I agree, right? but, but I think there has to be any kind or some sort of formal authority passed on you, on us. Because otherwise, when no one leads, everyone leads. Yeah. But when you're hired uh, as a product manager or even any, any other job, like what am, I, what am I responsible for? And if this is not clear, then we might be missing these formal authority Ritual because mm -hmm. and then of course you start and and you gain your trust of what you just and totally agree with you But there has to be some sort of a Authority comes like a formal and then the informal you earn and you build that trust But if the organization does not give you or you don't feel you're given these formal Passing of authority then becomes a struggle uh, you need to fight or convince, then you become a salesperson instead of a product person. And, and that's, that's exhausting. Us. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it is exhausting. But I think some sort of a formal authority has to be given and it should come with a role. When you're hired, this is your job description, this is your responsibility, ownership. You, yeah. You're going to be reporting on this, on that. Uh, without that, we might get lost we might get uh, exhausted and trying to convince and like people. Should I like people by doing my job? Or should I be just strong enough and say, this is what we do, like a Steve Jobs way, you know? Like, I don't care about the customer. I know what the customer wants. <laughs> Are we able to say that? But I think, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, the, it's the balance. Was, um, well, with Steve Jobs, he was also the CEO. So, well, yeah. And, and, and <laughs> you know, he, he could only be no. fired by the board, okay. whereas the PM can be fired by many players <laughs> within the organization. And that, you know, it's, it's a bit of a different uh -huh. report, but good example. So we have uh, most voted the question that's up next from Victoria. What do you do with all the hierarchies that are in the organization which may be afraid uh, because they don't see their place there? Get rid um, of them. No, I'm just yeah, I, <laughs> I, I, I wonder what you mean because even in a product-led growth model, you still need sales well, and, and marketing. They just change a bit their focus. You uh, just you just need to find that common area of, of mutual benefit between you and them. Uh, they are afraid uh, of product-led growth because, as you know, also what happened with AI, we're afraid that, that it's going to replace us, right? I mean, they are afraid that we are going to replace them. And it's, it's not that they need to understand that it's a collaboration, it's not a takeover. And there has to be this mutual benefit going uh, on. We're sharing the strategy, we're sharing everything, and provide that with evidence. This is, these are the practices, for example, uh, as you were saying, the, these uh, practices and like e evangelizing what, what we're trying to do and how we work and passing on the tools actually to educate them about, okay, so like the very basic things, uh, we need to do this, why do you need it? Like, you know, the five or seven whys, why do we need it, why do we need it? And keep challenging and try to educate them that this is a mindset of thinking. It's not, I'm not replacing your job, but I'm trying to, you know, establish a framework and a mindset mm. of thinking and so on. 
So finding that kind of collaboration and mutual benefit would help ease things with, uh, you know. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned fear. I think we live in, in, a, in a state of constant fear. Yeah. Uh, inflation, war, uh, AI, now now these people come and gonna take my job as a sales or marketing person. Yeah. They wanna run the marketing strategies. But I think as long as we are able to actually try to bring, sorry this sounds too philosophical, but uh, <laughs> try to bring peace in the midst of yeah. fear. Uh, and when you know your thing, uh, yes, people will see that when you actually are secure, uh, uh, convinced that, okay, this is the way we should go. This yeah. is the best for the company. This is what I believe. And this is based on this evidence and these arguments and these examples or experience from the past or the companies or their departments. And this is what they're doing. I think that's when we are able just stay in the, the first one and actually see that we're facilitating the yeah. value stream for the company. We're facilitating actually the customer experience or the customer satisfaction. And it's not a fight. It's not a, you know, now I'm going to do your job. I don't want to do yeah. your job. I want to do less. I hope AI oh, yeah. will help me do that, you know. But at least uh, as long as we, and, and probably I'm sorry it sounds also too mentory, but, mm -hmm. uh, but as long as we're able to be that person in our organizations that bring this state, this safe space and security that this is where we're going, I think we might be able to win the trust that we're looking for, you know? Cool. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, thanks a lot. Um, so there's one from Francisco, which I would say a lot. So to what extent uh, the organizational design impacts anything you want to do, right? Because if it's, it can either help or block you. And then I would take the next one from Jana. It's gone. Which, which is gone? Oh, no, it's there. I don't know. No. Oh, where, where is the... Uh, ah, all right, it's back. What would motivate product managers to share their product with co-hosters, growth leader? I'm assuming growth leader is more of a marketing person? Um, no, it's like product growth. Okay, but product growth is also a part of product. So if, if I understand correctly, it's more like how can you motivate others and, uh, and let them know that you're not trying to take their role by bringing that role into a product-led mindset. Is that correct? Uh, for me, the best example is Avengers Assemble, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's like we're a team. We're not here to compete. You have superpowers. I have superpowers. You have other superpowers. And together we come up with a, the best solution to tackle the challenge, the problem the users are facing, or the company goals, you know. Um, but I think that that builds and grows in time, and also the organization needs to provide these ventures, uh, well, sorry for the metaphor, but to provide for these uh, kind of a, a, I would say, culture, you know. Yeah. It, it's also working towards a common goal. For example, for the sales team, uh, fear of being replaced if you go from a sales uh, company to product-led growth. Uh, it's also reassuring, I think, to think that we're not replacing salespeople, but I think the role of sales uh, knows an evolution. For example, salespeople usually tend to be less consumed with numbers and signing, but they sort of become consultants. And so I remember having this conversation with a salesperson and actually telling them that, telling them that we share the same objective. They're now sort of a consultant, which means that they uh, have really valuable insights into the, the, the pains and the, and the of type of product evolution that you could have. You're not, cha you're not replacing their role, you're sort of changing it, but I think you're uplifting it a little bit. Yeah, because the, the, they are the first contact uh, point with, with the customers and uh, one of the main, uh, you know, feedback uh, channels. And um, as, as you said, we, we are not different teams. So like, mm. uh, you know, uh, business sales, marketing, whatever, and product, these are not different teams. Th these are the same team for one specific goal. So whatever the mm. function that they are serving, they're just, you know, with a different skill set. If put together, it's going to maximize, you know. Mm. 
Because at the end of the day, we're all optimizing for the same metrics anyways, right? We're, we're always reaching out for more sales or more conversions or more kind of count or depending on the metric for the, for the business. All right, so, we have two yeah. more minutes. Um, I like the question about the hierarchy and where should it sit under tech, under marketing or its own cluster? In newer companies, we've seen products sit under its own cluster. A traditional model has it under technology because it's considered IP, which is more of a cost, uh, cost structure. Other traditional companies also put it under marketing because they think, ah, this is uh, landing pages and CRM and, and something, so it needs to, to help with those. My personal preference, of course, would be to have a product management as its own C-level uh, department, but it also depends where some people went historically there. Um, there's also a positive movement we've seen with Tier Technology, one of our clients, where product took over some parts of marketing, including certain demand generation activities. So not only product was leading some parts of customer success and marketing, it, it became a bigger, way bigger department than other places we've seen, including, of course, product ops. I, I agree. I mean, if, if you're able to, to, uh, to decide or if you're able to rearrange the Lego, yes, of course, go <laughs> up the way to the C-level structure, like CPO and all the way down. But the reality is that there are things that we can influence and others we cannot. So I think the first question is, can you influence that decision? And if you cannot, the best way is to live with whatever structure you're in. I mean, are you able to change a company like IKEA or Booking? Or probably startup will be even easier, I would assume. Probably not. But uh, I think it's at the end, the, the main question about hierarchy is, am I able to influence that? I mean, that is structure, to create a new structure. I mean, you can always influence with your work and, and your results. But meaning, am I able to change it or not? Because if we're trying to change it and you cannot influence that, then it becomes a struggle and a battle probably you don't want to start or you don't, you don't want to be in, you know? So just make the best out of the hierarchy you're in. And if you can influence it, yes, great, do it. Let's start a mini revolution at IKEA. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I think we are done. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for all the engaging Thank questions. You. Thank yeah. you.